Connor's Tea. How are ye? Welcome to this special edition, multi-part epic. We're telling this story for the first time that we've ever told it. We haven't told it live. We haven't told it as a podcast. And we decided to put it into the format of a multi-part radio play. Well, kind of a radio play. Listen, you'll see. This story was constructed by Aaron and Surika based on the bilingual book The Battle of Ventry by Aegon Omar Hartig and Donal O'Brick which is a beautifully illustrated creation that we highly recommend you pick up if you're interested. It was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan with music and sound effects by Oshin Ryan. Additional voices by Neil Toner, Rory O'Shea and Nelson Endebele. This podcast was brought to you by our supporters at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. And if you'd like to join them, we'll be releasing bonus material about the writing and production of this epic on our Patreon channel very soon. But for now, settle in and enjoy. The Battle of Ventry, Part 1. Daradun was the king of the world. He ruled over every country, every nation, every land. From the rising of the sun to its setting, there was no place, north, south, east or west, where his name was not known and where tribute was not paid to the king of the world, Daradon. Except for one place, one small, insignificant little island. It was too small to matter, of course. It was too small for one as great as he to care about. It was too insignificant to pay any attention to, and he knew He could take it any time he wanted to. He just didn't want to. The palace of the king of the world was a glorious thing. Built with materials brought from every corner of the globe. In his menagerie, in his gardens, were creatures and birds and animals from all over. There were plants, there were foods, there were luxuries brought from every place. The wine he drank was the best in the world. The food he ate was the best in the world. The people who served him were the best in the world. And he knew this for a fact. Because he was the king of everything. But over time, the knowledge of that one insignificant country began to grow in his mind. It was like a tiny pebble trapped in the best pair of shoes he'd ever worn. Everything else might be comfortable, but there was that one little spot of irritation. And no matter how small it was, how insignificant in the greater scheme of things, It began to rankle more and more. It began to occupy more and more of his mind and his thoughts and even his dreams. He was attended in his gardens, in his palace, by the two kings of his two great armies. 
It was with their help that he had conquered all the world. The armies of the cat heads and the dog heads. And it was to these kings that he first spoke of his growing desire. To go to the last place on earth that did not recognize his sovereignty and break them. And the king of the dog heads looked at him with his white sharp teeth. And he said, Oh, Daradon, if you unleash me and my army on those people on that island, we will overwhelm them with our numbers. We will burn them in the earth with our savagery. We will tear out their throats. My warriors will feast on their flesh whether or not your enemies still breathe. Oh, my king, if you decide to invade this land, we will fight for you in our world. We will not kill your enemies direct. We will wound them. And then we will let them flee, thinking that there is hope. And we will do this again, and again, and again. And when at last your foes die, it will be as though they have died twice. Once for the hope that is in their hearts. And then, again, when the life leaves their bleeding bodies. And to this, Daradon said, This will be a show of strength, a display of my might. I will bring together an army the likes of which the world has never seen. And I will crush these rebels until there is no one on this planet who does not bow to Daradon, king of the world. And so Daradon, the king of the world, called together a council of war. On top of a high hill in Ireland, a small group of warriors were gathered. Most were already out of breath and some were bruised and bloodied from the hard and vigorous training early that morning. But they stood ready for the race and eager. They watched their captain, his grey hair framing his weathered expression, his skin as tough as leather, and he wore as many scars on his face as he had wrinkles. He stared at each one of them in turn. Despite their tired limbs, with this look from Fionn McCool, each one there was willing to push further than they could think possible to bear. Now he lifted his heavy spear, and with the practiced movement of his shoulders, arms and wrist, he flung it through the air. All eyes followed with bated breath and it struck with a thud in the dead center of its target over 50 yards from where he stood and when it hit it signaled the start of the race. They ran and pushed fast, elbows and hands flung wild to scurry past one another till they fell in rhythm with the baying of the hounds and the beating of their hearts. Their feet thundered on that cold hard earth like the beating of the drums. Though once famously fair in colour, Fionn's now grey hair flew over his shoulders as he threw himself into the lead. Few could match the speed of the fierce warrior, never mind his strength. But the grey, thin 
man of the Fianna was fleeter of foot than Fionn, and a thin grey streak blurred past him. He knew just who it was, Quilta Macronon, the fastest man in Ireland, if not the world. He set a pace no one could possibly match as he blistered along the path that led its way back around and down the steep rocky hillside. But in a dizzying display of daring, Fionn flew himself down the side of the cliff, seeing this was the quickest route many followed or fell in their attempt. But Fionn's footfall bounded him downward till he landed hard and fast at the bottom of the hill. With a joyous thrill now coursing through his veins, Fionn ran towards the opposite hill where the end was in sight. Between him and the end line was a thicket of trees split by a wild rushing river, the stony hillock behind with a steep high sight as tall as ten oak trees on top of one another. He left out a shout of glee and daring to motion those warriors onwards and push harder towards the end. Pushing them to be their best was never a problem. Getting them to be a match for Fionn had always been the challenge. Another blur of motion streaked in front as two great hounds ran with him. The enormous brindle coat of Bram bundled past as the sleeker white fur of Skjolon swung in and around, making it a game with her master as she moved with ease and grace beside his effort-filled strides. The red stripe running from her nose to the tip of her tail just gave Fionn that ample fuel to add to his fire. He graciously bundled through the forest, not disturbing a single twig on the floor or a bird hanging in the branches of the trees. He heard the others rushing in behind his heart beat in shock as sweat and heat were swept away by the cold current of the water rushing around him. He waded through the river till he reached the other side. He heaved and moved and clambered and clutched up through the falling stones and unsettled settled soil. He heard the grunts of effort from the others below and from behind he spied the familiar fair hair splashing through the water which gave him more urgency not to be beaten by his own son, Oshin. He also heard the howling manic laughter of his grandson come to his ears. Fionn clambered over the final few rocks till he reached the steep hilltop and... What took you so long? Said the fleet-footed Quilta McRone on with a wry smile across his thinly pressed lips. His pale complexion barely showed signs of breaking a sweat. The leader of the Fina, Fionn, gave him a savage grin and waited for the rest to follow. He knew the day of training was only starting. There would be feats to practice, wrestling matches and combats, but for now, a brief reprieve. He would always take part, always push more, but he led by example. He lived and enlivened his honour code throughout all of the Fianna. Purity of heart, strength of limb, and actions to match his words. That's how he got the best out of the Fianna. And the Fianna were the best. His warriors gathered, panting around him. Some sat, others flung themselves in a heap. Their captain, Fionn, looked across the hills of Ireland and felt a pang of worry enter his heart. It often did. They had to train to be their best because at any second they may be called into a fight. But whether it was a fight from near or afar, he never would know. There was a king on every hill in this land, so some said. And though he had friends and allies in many of the kings, he had enemies too. The Fianna were not bound to any land. They sought no protection and offered no payments to kings for such things. So they were outside of any law in more ways than one. Fionn was unfailingly generous. Everyone knew that. In the cold times of the winter, he had many doors he could knock on and would expect a warm greeting in return. 
but when they stayed in the house of any one king, Fionn would offer up the strength of the Fianna in return, if the host was ever in need of it. This, in turn, could easily, well, turn some other feuding kings against him for another future rivalry. Just one other problem to consider. But now it was summer and it was warm. They foraged and hunted wild game and slept beneath the stars in the wide open places. And though he always lived by his words, sometimes his words were not what a king wanted to hear. Ireland's landscape was fractured from tribal feud and fighting. It had always been that way. But the captain of the Fianna was slow to aid any one king for their own selfish reasons on demand. So despite being protector of the island for everything that it stood for, Fionn was anything but a favourite among all of the kings. Even the High King of all Ireland hated him. Fionn had only just returned from France after needing to go into exile abroad for a while to lie low while the king's temper cooled off. After he had offended him somehow. He scarcely could recall the details now, but regardless, King Cormac MacArt was no friend or ally of Fionn's at this time. He distrusted the might of the Fianna and resented Fionn for any number of reasons. As he looked across the hills of Ireland in deep contemplation, Fionn felt a familiar tension rising. He recognised this deep worry. It felt like a warning and he habitually pressed his thumb into the crook of the index finger on his left hand as if to push the worry away. Are you alright? The voice of his son Oshin asked. Snapped out of his worried wanderings, Fionn nodded and before he could respond, two crashing characters fell down next to him, pushing each other out of their way. Stop there! I mean, you're not here for no, You just jumped in there! Well, you will beat you! Great Conan, entangling Gull, dragging him down to the ground in a wrestling match. Neither one really had the energy for after that race. Fionn looked at them. Ye both came last. And with that, Fionn turned to continue the rest of the morning's training. Daradun, the king of the world, called together a council of war to discuss his plans to invade the last island that did not swear fealty to him. The island of Ireland. Many of the kings and queens were enthusiastic in their reaction. The King of France had his own reasons for wanting to invade Ireland. His own vengeance, his own agenda. The King of Norway, a fearsome warrior with a shield that had been forged in the fires of hell, voiced his support. I and my forebrothers will gladly lend our strength to this battle. Forna of the two blades, my youngest brother, Takta dressed head to foot in iron, Mangnuk with his poisoned flail. It will be glorious. Daradun noticed the nine sons of Garo, off in a corner and muttering amongst themselves. The eldest Dollar Dorf was one he was a little wary of. Having eight such fearsome warriors in his family, if he ever bent his mind to politics instead of the battlefield, this one might be a threat to the king of the world himself. So he called out, What say you, sons of Garov? What say you, Dollar Dorfa? We will fight for you, and we will fight and win glory for our name. The king of the marshes boasted loudly for all to hear. I will conquer this island single-handedly for you, my king. 
Og Aramuk, the daughter of the King of Greece and the greatest warrior any of them had ever known, said nothing. She merely smiled. Og Aramuk had no use for empty boasts, for hollow shows of bravado. She knew her worth. She had a body like iron, and she was as beautiful as she was strong, and she was as intelligent as she was beautiful. And she knew besides that there was a prophecy that the next person to rule over all the world would be a woman. And so Og Aramuk was content to wait in line. And with that agreed, with their destination chosen, Daradun asked, Does anyone know a land and place? A place with a wide flat beach for battles and sports. A place where the hunting and the supplies nearby will be plentiful. A staging point for this invasion. And one man there, an Irishman named Gloss McDrowan, spoke up and answered the king of the world. I will. I will show you a wide, sandy beach to land on. A perfect place for the invasion. I will guide you there. I will show you where to land. I will guide you through the reefs and treacherous rocks of the coast. Daradun asked him why he was so quick to betray his countrymen. And Glass McDrowan replied, Well, you see, uh, I'm banished from Ireland. I, well, I'm on the run and I can't go back there. I was once a member of, you might know them, the Fianna. At mention of that word, a ripple of unease spread through the chamber. The Fianna. Warriors of legend. And though they had not spoken of them yet, all who were there knew. This was the reason that Ireland was unconquered. These warriors, these outlaws in their own land, they were what had prevented the king of the world from making this assault years ago. And in spite of all their boasting and bravado, every one of them felt a cold chill down the back of his neck at the thought of hearing the Dord Fian when they landed on that foreign shore. But I made a bargain with the High King of Ireland, Conor McGarrett is his name, that I would sell him information from the Fianna, tell him what Fionn McCool was up to and the likes. Well, Fionn McCool found out, didn't he? He was furious, so I heard, and so I ran. I went into exile. I had to. Can't return to Ireland now, and well, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like nothing better than to get some vengeance on Fionn and the Fianna for, well, well, you know, forcing me into exile and that. If there had been a ripple around the room at the name the Fianna, there was even more of a one at the name of its leader, Fionn McCool. But Dara Dunn held up his hand. He said, This will be the greatest army ever assembled on the face of the world. We will sail in such a force that no army could possibly withstand us. He was so sure of his victory to come that the king of the world there and then declared that they would divide the island up amongst all the kings and queens there gathered before they had assembled their troops, before they had marshaled their resources, 
before they had even set sail. Rumors of war came to the ears of King Cormac MacArt, the High King of all Ireland. The messenger stood watching the king after delivering such bad news he wasn't sure which way his mood would go. He told the king a giant fleet of ships were setting sail and soon to land in Ireland to invade the land. Not for the first time had bad news like this come to the ears of the High King, Cormac MacArt. The King of Lachlan had tried on many occasions, but Fionn and the Fianna had always been a match for any such invasion, he thought. If the King of the World was as fierce as his reputation, perhaps, Cormac thought, this might take care of Fionn McCool for him once and for all, and the Fianna. Fionn would no doubt, after all, want to fight and protect the land, no matter where this mighty fleet landed. So he came to the conclusion that instead of preparing a war and gathering all of the counties and kings together in one great army, which was no easy feat, he could let one enemy take care of the other, while he loses nothing in the process. A sickly sweet smile came to the mouth of Cormac, and he nodded his thanks to the messenger, but gave no orders after that, and watched the scared man scurry off. When the news came to Fionn McCool a few days earlier, however, he had a different reaction altogether. It seemed his worries had been confirmed. A tyrant, a bully worse than any of the homegrown ones was coming from afar to invade and plunder and take what he wanted from Ireland? Fionn gritted his teeth. They would need every single man and woman of the Fianna to even face this fight, but gathering them all was not so easily done. And where to gather, he thought. He sent lookouts, placed on every hill and cliff overlooking the coast and beaches, the bays and inlets, to any river wide enough that might allow such an army to gather and land there. He sent runners to each and every fraction of the seven factions of the Fianna who were spread all throughout the island to begin to make their preparations to gather for a battle the scale of which none would have ever seen. Of the men that were with him, a small favoured few of the Fianna, he sent his grandson Oscar of the many feats out west. Quilta went fleet of foot up north. He sent his own son Oshin east. Then he sent for one of the best of the Banthian, which would make her out to be one of the best women in Ireland, if not the best. Dar Dov, the woman of the Black Mountain. Dar Dov spoke with reassuring words to Fionn. Do not worry, Fionn. By nightfall, the Fianna will have eyes on every inch of Ireland's coast, and we will crush this threat. Fionn nodded gravely and instructed her to go south. Fionn decided to bring one of his other sons, Fergus of the Fair Speech, to speak for him when he needed. So he would go to At Swim Two Birds. He thought it was as good a place as any to gather a great mass of the Fianna there and wait until they were ready to go wherever they were told to go, once the lookouts reported back. He nodded and left. When news spread, the Fianna quickly put a lookout on every hill overlooking any potential landing, and a young, fresh-faced member, only newly joined to the Fianna, Con Critter was his name, sat on top of Kion Thra, overlooking Ventry Bay. He watched as the horizon turned black and clouds began to gather. He saw flashes of light streak across the night sky. A terrible storm was brewing, making its way towards him, and even as he thought that, he could hear the low grumble of thunder rolling over the coast and a lashing of rain pouring down over him. 
He sought shelter quickly then and scurried to a steady and safe and dry bedding beneath a low falling tree with luck would have it a soft, dry, mossy filled hollow underneath. He tied branches down above and around and buried his head in between warm blankets and looked out at the darkness consuming Ventry Bay. He'd only recently joined the Fina, a dream of his from boyhood, but he knew he still had to prove himself as a warrior in amongst the eyes of the great Fina. But he was still fresh faced in so many of their eyes right now, and he knew he would have to do something great in order to be remembered as one of the famous warriors of the Fina. Perhaps this lookout post was his chance to do such a daring thing. And he began to dream of all of the many great deeds he could perform in a battle to come. He closed his eyes for just a moment, and in the blackness he dreamt of such great deeds as the deep, dark sky rumbled outside. The storm howled down upon them, tossed their barks to and fro, and everyone who was not sick was clinging for dear life, as they were buffeted and blown. An ill omen, Daradon wondered for a moment, but then he shook the thought from his head. No. This was not an omen. This was the true battle. Getting to this benighted island was the struggle. As soon as they landed, facing a foe would be the easy part. At last, the storm blew itself out, and Daradun came up on deck. The fleet behind him blackened the horizon, and ahead of him was a rock jutting up out of the water like the broken fang of a giant. And he turned to Glass MacDrowan and said, Is this your landing place? This craggy coast? Oh, no, no, I no. It is a fine flat, sandy beach I'm leading you to. Ventry, they call it. Sure, that island you see there is. Sure, that's just a rock. That, that's Skellig. It is no place for us feet to be landing. <laughs> and on they went until they turned a headland and found before them a beautiful, wide, shallow, sandy bay with the fair sand glinting in the late evening sun. And the fleet of the king of the world was so vast that when all of the ships pulled up at anchor in that bay, the water could not be seen between their hulls, and men could walk from ship to ship all across the bay. Daradun called for his war council, and he asked, Whose part of this island are we on, seeing as we've divided it up already? The King of Spain replied that it was his land they were on. It is your duty to do supply us with food then, because we are on your lands, and the laws of hospitality will prevail. Therefore, it is up to you to provision the army. Glass MacDrowan told the King of Spain that there were four ring forts within easy raiding distance of the beach, and the King of Spain set out with his army at his back to go pillaging and bring back provisions for the army of the King of the World. Fresh face of Khan Critter awoke with a bolt. 
The sound of battle screams and burning met his ears. Women and children were shouting as men's roars went up with smoke and sounds of burning timber down the bay. He leapt out of his safe and all to secure a shelter. It had been too sound. He had slept right through a battle. And with horror, he looked out at the chaos that met his eyes. Billowing smoke above the force dotted along the bay. Men rushing them and driving out what they wanted as they tossed the rest. Khan turned his head to the shoreline and gasped. The sand was blackened with ships. The entire bay was filled. Not an inch could be spared. A fleet of ships so vast and of different sizes and shapes with different coloured sails all across the bay of entry. He had missed it, slept right through his lookout. The king of the world had landed here on his post. The post might as well have been empty for all the good he'd done. Oh, it would have been better if his mother had never borne him into life at all, for the destruction below was now on his hands. He couldn't face the Fianna now to tell him he had slept through his post. To tell Fionn sent a shiver through his heart. He was too ashamed he couldn't face it. He must make things right. A cold, dark look crossed his fresh face and he gritted his teeth in determination. He would march down to meet the men burning these fires around Ventry Bay and they would speak of how he stood against an army one day, single-handed con critter against the rest. This was the only way to redeem his mistake. He marched straight down the hillside and as he came close to the first burning fort, three women stepped out in front of him. Con critter. Of the fresh face, we have come to your aid in your time, in your time, time of deepest, deepest, need. deepest need. Who are you? We, we are three, are three who, who have fallen in love with you from afar, far. Khan of the, of fresh, the fresh face. face. Are you Bonba, Bola, and Aru? Uh, we are we not. not. Or, dare I say your name, the Maragu. Maka, Bob, and Anand. No, although the goddess of battle fury is somewhere nearby. Who are you then, if not a triple goddess of the two Adai Danon? We are the three daughters of the king of the Tyre. We have heard tales of you, and we have come to you from far away to help you in your fight. But I have done no great deeds, nothing worthy of great tales to spread far and wide. Men tell tales of blood and slaughter. Women tell different tales. Now we will give you the gift of our healing well. No matter how great your injury, you will be restored from the brink of death. Simply wade in and wash away the pain. And we will grant this too to one other of your choosing, so you may be able to aid each other to recover from the battle. Khan stood mesmerized watching the three magic women wave their hands and present a healing pool between them. Steam rose and filled his nostrils with the sweet scented herbs of healing. We will aid you in your fight today. We will cast a spell on your enemy's eyes. So while on this land they will see a huge force running behind you to bring them to doom. And today, you will kill a great, a great king, king in battle. With this prophecy, 
and these magic gifts, his desire for the fight flared up. Perhaps the stories would be truly spoken about the day Con Critter stood against an army and he ran towards the burning flames inside the nearest fort. Still not thinking or having any thought of sending a message to Fionn and the rest of the Fianna. <laughs>